Life Squared, a novel written by and read by George Trombley. Chapter 9, George. George sat in a small interrogation room with his right arm handcuffed to a cold metal table. He had seen enough true crime documentaries to know that it was standard practice to isolate a suspect before the interview. In the last three years, George had read or listened to over a hundred true crime novels. He was ready. He knew that during the interview, the police would use the revised read technique, originally developed in the 1950s by a former police officer turned psychologist. The techniques were designed to get a confession, and with an uneducated suspect, the techniques worked well. The clock on the wall now showed 12.30 p.m. After being alone for 45 minutes, two officers dressed in white dress shirts and beige pants entered the interrogation room. Hello, George. I'm Officer Gonzalez, and this is my partner, Officer Santilli. Is there anything we can get for you? A drink? Some food? Nice try. Yes, you can get me my lawyer, George responded sternly. Officer Gonzalez responded in a friendly tone, but left no room for George to interject, even if he wanted to. Okay, look, George. I want you to know that we're here to help you, and that at any time you can tell us to stop and we'll reach out and get you a lawyer. Right now, we just want to find out what happened, and the thing is we already know what happened at Locos Tacos, so maybe you could just fill us in with some of the details by telling us what you were doing that day, starting with the time you woke up, and then what you did after that. Never speak to the police, even if you're innocent. I am requesting a lawyer, George said in a flat tone. Officer Gonzalez acknowledged his request. Sure, we're going to help facilitate that. And just so you know, I've read your profile on Trainers for Hire, and you've done quite a bit of training these last three years. It's pretty impressive. I honestly could use a trainer like you since I'm really bad at keeping my consistency. What's your secret to consistency? Nice try building rapport. George knew the police would do anything to get him talking. Once a suspect begins talking, it's easy for them to keep talking. And if the police do the technique well, the suspect will believe the police are on their side. George cleared his throat. <clears throat> Lawyer. Officer Gonzalez tried to play on George's sense of empathy. Is this really how you want to go down? Alexander's family just wants closure, and they've lost their only son. You're the only one who can give them closure. This guy doesn't give up and needs to take pause when he speaks. George didn't say anything. The officer continued. I don't think you hurt Alexander on purpose. Accidents happen. And frankly, I wasn't there, so I don't know how it all went down. I think it's possible Alexander provoked you. And what were you to do? Of course you had to defend yourself. Who wouldn't? I would. Let me help you. What did Alexander do to you? Officer Gonzalez was moving fast on the technique, and George, for a brief moment, almost talked when self-defense was mentioned. But if you watch enough of these interviews, you know it never ends well when you talk to the police. You read me my rights. I have a right to speak to an attorney. I'm exercising that right, George said. All right, this is it, though. This is the last time I'll be able to help you. Once the lawyer's standing here in between us, we won't be able to have this type of conversation. If you have something to say that you think will help me help you, now is your chance. The lawyer isn't going to make anything better. What makes you think you need one? George just shook his head and said, Lawyer. Officer Gonzalez was deflated. Who do you have in mind? You got their number? I don't. Just provide me with the public defender like I was promised, George said. The officers left the room, and George was again alone. I wish they would at least let me have that last Shizen tea, George sighed. What's Kim going to think when she sees the news? Would she even care? She would probably think this was all Square's fault. And maybe it was. If he would have just got the food and come back to the table, none of this would have happened. It was just over an hour later when Officer Gonzalez came back in the room and removed George's handcuffs. Public defender, eh? George was confused. Yeah? Gonzalez was irritated as he spoke. I don't know what you think you're accomplishing by wasting my fucking time getting you a public defender. What happened to innocent before proven guilty? You're telling me my constitutional right to be provided a lawyer is a waste of your time? You know damn well you didn't need a public defender, but you decided to waste the state's resources. He was visibly angry. George didn't remember this being part of any interrogation technique. I have no idea what you are talking about. I don't have a lawyer. Yeah, right. You just sit and wait, Officer Gonzalez said as he walked out of the interrogation room, slamming the door. A few minutes later, now close to two o'clock, a knock came on the door and a white-haired woman walked into the room. 
sat down at the table and passed George a card. The name said, Jessica Rutherford, attorney at law. I'm Jessica, but you can call me Jesse. We have a mutual acquaintance that insisted I help you. Square? Of course it's Square. I'm not sure if I want help from Square. Jesse looked confused. Square? You're not from... George realized he shouldn't have said Square's name. He just assumed Square had sent the lawyer to protect his project. Who sent you? I do quite a bit of pro bono work for the People First Shelter downtown, Jesse said. How did they know I was here? George asked. This case has been on the news all morning. And even though publicly, all that's known is someone has been arrested, your name started circulating on the private boards and eventually spread to the public social networks. It seems that hashtag justice for Alexander has been trending, so the public interest is quite high. This isn't good. So much for my privacy. I'm already being judged by the Pitchfork Army, George lamented. Well, the good news is it doesn't matter what private information leaks. None of it can be used in court, Jesse told him. Okay, so what do we do next? Jesse answered, People First has put me on retainer for you. You'll just need to approve a standard representation agreement so I can act on your behalf. She pulled an e-pad out of her case and pushed it towards George. George read the agreement and pressed his finger to all the appropriate places, including the final spot that put the agreement in force. All right, Mr. Williams, I'm now officially your lawyer, and that means everything you say to me is protected by client attorney privilege. By law, they must disable all recording equipment. She gestured to the camera mounted in the corner. Not seeing any lights, he assumed that meant it wasn't recording, but he wasn't sure. The lawyer continued, So, how about you let me know all that's happened? The truth, and nothing but the truth, as they say. Then we can navigate what to do based on that. George still felt uncomfortable thinking about just dumping all of his information to a person he just met, but facing a murder charge had backed him into a corner. George swallowed the spit in his mouth and cleared his throat. He started by telling Jesse about Square's inflated cash offer for training. Once he got started speaking, it got easier. He told her everything he could think of. The fateful event at the taco stand, the fake client spy Amelia, and the nest of police that he walked into after leaving letter building when he was arrested. Jesse took notes and asked questions for clarification multiple times. After taking a few minutes to review her notes, the lawyer spoke. As you said, it won't be clean cut with your MMA fighting background, but... I think we have a good case for self-defense. So what's the next step? George asked. Well, they've already executed a search warrant on your apartment and found the cash you received from Mr. Puppenmacher. If we're lucky, we can go before the judge in the morning and get bail. But the district attorney is most likely going to claim you're a flight risk because of the cash. I'm a flight risk? I can't very well go far on $5,000, George said. Yes, but it's enough for you to leave the state. I'll do our best to expedite getting in front of the judge, but depending on how busy the docket is, you might be held downtown for a few days. Downtown? George asked. Yes, it's standard practice to be sent to the jail downtown since this is just a substation. You'll be processed and put into a single cell by yourself until they determine bail. George let out a sigh. I don't really want to go to jail. Jesse shook her head in agreement. No one does, but that's the system we must abide by. I'm confident we can get you out on bail based on the self-defense aspect alone. Your volunteer work at People's First also shows your connections to the community. But first, we need to get in front of the judge. So let me get started on that. Jesse stood up to leave. George said, Before you go, can I ask you two favors? Jesse pushed her chair under the table. Sure, ask away. First, tell Joe at People First that I owe him. I will. And your second favor? It's more of a question, I guess. You said that everything we discuss is protected by client-attorney privilege, right? Of course. I just want to confirm that anyone else I talk to about my case could be compelled to testify? If you're married, your spouse won't be compelled to testify, and of course you yourself are not required to testify. But if you talk to anyone here in jail, you should assume Omni will have a video or audio record. You did the right thing not speaking to the police. It's a shame how many clients wouldn't be in jail now if they had just kept quiet. The best thing you can do is imagine that anyone you talk to is the police. Of course, this excludes me or other legal representation. What about an assigned caretaker? George asked, thinking about Kim, though she had yet to contact him. While I don't agree with it, assigned caretakers can be compelled to testify. From the moment you were arrested until the charges are dropped or you are found not guilty, you need to assume everything you do and say will be recorded and eventually played back in court. 
The only protected conversation at this point is the one we're having right now. I can't talk to Kim even if I want to. George felt lost. To be blunt, George, you keep your mouth shut and you'll make my job a lot easier. George nodded his head. Understood. Thank you for your help. We'll get through this, George. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. She knocked on the metal door and the guard outside let her out. George hoped she was right about bail, but he had a feeling he wouldn't be home anytime soon. Chapter 10. George. Thirty minutes ticked slowly off the clock in the interrogation room where George was handcuffed to a table like a forgotten dog. A soft knock came at the door and George yelled, Come on in. I just got out of the shower. Officer Santilli from the initial interrogation came into the room with a more conciliatory tone. Sorry to keep you waiting. Looks like we're moving you to the county jail for a few days. That's what I hear, George said. There's a transport here to take you. They'll process you and get you a cell. Any chance I can get a phone call? Your ride is waiting. You can make a call when you get to the jail, the officer said as he snapped the cuffs on George's wrists behind his back. After a short walk to the garage, George saw a black van with large white letters saying SDPD Prisoner Transport on the side, with its large sliding door open. The transport looked like it was 15 or 20 years old, and the front left tire seemed a bit low in air. There were two other inmates already loaded in the forward and middle seat. Santilli pointed and said, All the way to the back. Once George was seated, Santilli secured his seatbelt and said, Good job not bowing to Gonzalez's pressure. The guy needs a chill pill. George wasn't expecting Santilli to say what he was thinking himself during the interrogation. I'm guessing he's always like that, George said. Yeah, unfortunately, Santilli said. He then stepped out of the van and yelled, Prisoners secured, and slammed the sliding door shut. The driver turned the key in the ancient van's ignition, and the engine turned over a few times. It had been years since George sat in a car that wasn't electric or hydrogen-fueled. On the next try, the engine started humming unevenly and the driver began driving the van through a series of unmanned gates that opened automatically as the van got near. The driver picked up a mic and his voice came through the speakers in the back of the van. Gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We know you have a choice in inmate transport, but we assure you a swift service to your final destination, the San Diego County Jail. The officer in the passenger seat laughed loudly and said, There isn't any food or beverage service either. The driver continued, For the duration of the short trip, we ask that you keep your cuffs in the locked and secured position. Both officers laughed together, and the one not driving was laughing so hard he slapped his hands on the dash. The inmate in front shifted in his seat and shouted, You both need to shut your fucking mouths. This ain't no fucking comedy show. The officer not driving turned around and pointed his finger at him. Hey man, you're the one that got into this situation. If you don't want to get shivved by another inmate, you're the one that needs to learn to shut your mouth. The inmate muttered something under his breath that George couldn't hear. The rest of the trip, the officers fetishized about a new hot blonde fresh from the academy that had been assigned to the evidence room and what they would do with her if she'd let them. George wondered what the requirements were to be a police officer and what sensitivity training, if any, they went through. The van pulled into the jail garage. George was the last inmate out of the van. A rotund, older officer instructed the inmates to stand behind a white line and wait for their turn. George watched the other two inmates get processed at the intake counter while the older officer picked his nose when he thought George wasn't looking. After the second inmate moved from the counter, he said, All right, it's your turn. George walked to the counter and the intake officer asked, You are George Williams, inmate 9994? Correct, I'm George Williams, but that's the first I've heard of my number. The intake officer held up a bag of personal items that George had with him at the time he was arrested and read aloud each item as he input them into the system. One black leather wallet containing two credit cards and $500 in cash. One black D screen with cracked screen. One San Diego driver's license. One certified trainer card. One bottle of green tea. George asked the officer, You think I could just drink that tea now? 
Sorry, it's against regulations. But I'll make sure to put it in the refrigeration unit, he said with a smile that looked sincere. Thank you, George said. Can you tell me when I can make a phone call? George wanted to hear Kim's voice, even if she was still angry with him. During orientation, you'll be informed of your phone times. Phone calls will be free of charge, courtesy of Proposition 21, but you will only get five minutes during your phone time. The good news is, you can call as many people as you like during that time, he told George. I only need to call one person. George wondered if Kim would even pick up. Thank you, George said, followed by a small sigh. The guard looked at the line of fresh inmates just arriving, then back to George and said, Listen, you want some friendly advice? I suppose it couldn't hurt, since I've never been locked up. The guard's face was serious but kind. Yeah, that's why I'm offering the advice. When you're making your phone calls, keep your back to the wall, and don't trust anyone. Don't take anything from anybody. Don't give favors, and don't take any favors, and you'll get through this. It was known amongst inmates that once you took something from someone, you would owe something back. And giving a favor to another inmate could put you on the wrong side of that inmate's enemies. George had read similar advice before, but the words were significantly heavier coming from a veteran guard in taking him into the county jail on a charge of murder. Thanks for the advice, and thanks for treating me like a human. A concerned look came over the guard's face. I hope you weren't mistreated elsewhere by one of us. If so, let me know. George apologized, realizing his mistake. No, sorry, I haven't been mistreated, unless you count the overzealous interrogation. I've probably read too much true crime. George wished he was just reading a novel, but this was real life. Whether his crime could be judged as self-defense or not, he was guilty, and was most likely looking at a few years in jail. The guard half smiled. You'll have a lot of time to read those novels here. George's mouth smirked a half smile. Hopefully not that much time. The guard put his hands on the counter and said, Just watch your back. Everyone here claims they're innocent, and some of them very well might be, but you need to assume they're guilty if you want to make it through this ordeal. What makes you sure I'm not guilty? George asked. Your disposition, I guess. I get the feeling you got mixed up in something, but what do I know? All right, you can move on to biometrics. Good luck. The next station had a glass scanner on the counter. An emotionless woman in a uniform one size too big said in a flat tone, Both hands flat on the scanner. Don't move. After a flash of white light, she said, Right hand, palm up. George complied, and she fit a circular device on his pointer finger, and a needle from inside pricked it. George flinched. You could have warned me. What did you think was going to happen? She removed the device and dropped it into a bag labeled Inmate 9994. She handed a small vial to George and said, Spit saliva up to the white line. George gathered the saliva in his mouth, then spit it into the vial just going over the white line. If they'd let me drink my green tea, I could have gotten you more. She ignored what he said and handed him a fluorescent orange and yellow striped jumpsuit and a cloth bag with his inmate number printed on a piece of paper stuffed under a plastic sleeve. Prints, saliva, blood. This was all analog data and not covered under the DPRA, but the way it could be used and tracked, even by law enforcement, changed dramatically under the amendment. Unfortunately for George, a conviction for murder or manslaughter would significantly change his rights. George dreaded the thought of losing his right to privacy, which is exactly what happens for up to five years after a guilty verdict. People were angry when they thought of a murderer or sex offender having privacy rights. So in order to pass a tight vote in the Senate, strong exceptions to the rules were added, and essentially, felons lost their right to any privacy. In fact, they had less privacy now than before the amendment. You're done, the unfriendly woman said, followed by, next, to the inmate after George. The two inmates ahead of George were sent to a large room with inmate orientation written in large white letters on a plaque above the door. George was also on his way to orientation when a guard came out of the door behind the biometrics counter and said, I'll take this one from here, he told the guard walking with George. It's body scanner for this guy. He put his hand on George's shoulder, guiding him to the door he had just come from. Body scanner? Those guys in front of me were sent to orientation, George said with a confused look. The guard seemed to stumble for his words. 
It's, uh, it's like a random check. Those guys weren't as lucky as you, I guess. Lucky my ass. Look, can you just randomly check the next guy? The guard shook his head immediately. No, they told me you're getting a scan and you're getting a scan. He pushed George into the scanning room. It was a small round room with a horizontal metal bench. The walls were lined with a series of black and white glass bumps. Take off all of your clothes except your undergarments and put them in the bag, then hang it on the hook. Don't put on the jumpsuit until you're told. Having no choice, George stripped down to his underwear. Over the intercom, George heard a new voice. He seemed to be the technician running the machine. Lay down on the bench and don't move. It'll just take a few seconds. Since when do inmates get a free medical scan? George asked. We just got it. It's the latest, greatest med bio scanner. It checks for contraband, scans your brain for chemical imbalances, does a full cardiovascular workup, and does a way more detailed DNA scan than the saliva test. The doors of the chamber sealed shut, and George's inner ear popped like on an airplane. It's not going to give me cancer, is it? George asked. No, sir. It's not an x-ray or anything like that. It uses ultrasound like for pregnant women, so it's safe, the technician assured him. George hated scanners ever since his first MRI. He joked to lighten the mood. Be sure to let me know if I'm pregnant. You're a funny guy. All right, stay still. There was a three-second buzz that vibrated through George's body. What was that buzzing? George asked. I told you it's a new machine, right? Normally it's quieter. Hang on. Oh yeah, I didn't properly engage the scan. Here we go. George waited a few seconds, but nothing happened. You going to do it? George asked. Actually, I just got it. I told you it was quieter. Well, how do I look? George asked. I'm not officially allowed to tell you, but you sure have broken a lot of bones, buddy. I'll make sure someone comes and looks at your right hand. Seems like you have some fractures. George held up his right hand. His two broken fingers were wrapped tightly in white tape. Didn't need a scan to know about those. They tell me you'll be given a copy of your scan at the end of your sentence, along with one taken right before you leave. What's the good of getting a scan when I leave? What if they find a major sickness that could have been treated? George asked, honestly wanting to know the answer. Makes sense, especially with such a sophisticated machine. My guess is that it's less about finding sickness and more about protecting the state from unwarranted lawsuits. But that's above my pay grade, the technician told him. George copied Kim's words. Capitalism at its finest. All right, you can put your jumpsuit on now. Now in his jumpsuit, a guard entered and handcuffed him again. He was led to the inmate orientation room where four other new inmates were already waiting. A large woman behind glass spoke into a mic. Welcome to San Diego jail. Meal times will be different depending on your cell location. You will be notified prior to meal times via a directed sound wave in your cell. Whenever you leave your cell, you will be handcuffed. If you decide you don't want to be handcuffed, then you won't eat. Now direct your attention to the monitor. A short video about rules of contact and how the commissary worked showed on an ancient 4K TV hanging in the corner. After the video ended, the lady spoke again. Visiting hours are from 6.30 to 6 p.m. five days a week, with no visits allowed on Wednesdays and Thursdays. On Saturdays, visiting times are extended to 7 p.m. George's heart sunk. It was Thursday. Even if Kim decided to visit, she wouldn't be able to. George had lost most of his hope. Each of you will be assigned a 10-minute phone block in which you can make up to five minutes in free calls, thanks to Proposition 21. And it's your responsibility to notify us if you require your phone block. You cannot trade phone block times or sell or buy minutes from other inmates. George's phone block was 6 p.m. Not sure if Kim would even pick up, he decided to call and at least leave a message. After orientation, George was led to his cell down a long corridor filled with no less than five cameras. George wished he could have traded a camera for a clock. Mind telling me the time? The guard said, It's just after five. Can I assume there's a clock in my cell? No clocks in the cell. How will I know when my phone block is? The guard monotonously responded, There is a jail-wide announcement twice a day. Wake up and lights out. Personal announcements will be directed to you with a wave. They arrived in front of a cell which had a heavy metal door with thick glass windows on top and a rectangular opening near the middle bisecting the door. The guard opened the door and pointed to a lighted circle on the wall near the head of a single-sized bed. If you need to know the time, that circle gives you access to OPS. 
OPS? George asked. Omni Prison Service. It gives you limited access to Omni Services, but just remember you will be charged $2 per minute of time used, which will be billed at the end of each month or at time of release if your funds are limited. Sheesh, I can't get away from Omni anywhere. What can I do with it exactly? Ask the time, request a guard, and a few other things, he answered. Will you be coming to get me for my phone block? George asked. My shift ends at 5.30. If you've got a phone call to make, you can tap OPS no earlier than 10 minutes before your scheduled block and we'll come get you. Understood. George was finally alone. He laid his head down on the thin pillow and waited for phone time. It only took a few minutes before he was in a deep sleep. Chapter 11. George. George jolted awake, not sure where he was. He rubbed his eyes, still disoriented from his sleep. His 6 by 12 foot cell came into focus and he remembered that he was in the San Diego jail. The blue light of the Omni Prison Service Circle was slowly blinking. He reached up and touched it. A voice similar to the Omni Guide at the letter building greeted him. Hello, inmate 9994. What can I help you with? With a slightly raspy voice, he asked, What time is it? It's 6.47 p.m., Omni answered. George touched the blue circle again. What time is it? It's 6.47 p.m., Omni answered. Damn it. George had missed his phone block. George touched the blue circle again. Omni answered. Hello, inmate 9994. What can I help you with? I missed my phone block. Is there anything I can do to make a call? Your phone block is from 6 p.m. to 6.10 p.m. If you wish to make a phone call, you must notify a guard no earlier than 5.50 p.m. George touched the blue circle again. I asked if there was anything I can do to make a call after my phone block. Omni repeated the same answer verbatim. Useless. George laid on his cot, looking up at the cell room ceiling. It was concrete with a single LED light panel tucked in a protected cove. George scanned the rest of the cell. There were no light switches to control the light. A bell sounded from the OPS. Dinner is starting momentarily. If you wish to eat, please let me know, and a guard will be dispatched. George didn't have an appetite. He responded, I don't require dinner. The OPS acknowledged this, and George rolled on his side with his back to the blue light of the OPS and went back to sleep. Every few hours, a loud scream or random yelling from other inmates would wake George from his sleep. This cycle continued until the next morning when a directed sound wave woke George. You have a visitor. Stand with your back to the cell door and put your hands through the opening. George tapped the blue circle. What time is it? It's 6.30 a.m. George had slept through the night. Who's the visitor? George asked. OPS responded, Stand with your back to the cell door and put your hands through the opening. George stood up and turned his back to the cell door, putting his hands into the opening as directed. A guard arrived and handcuffed him. He was walked down the corridor through two locked doors into a 10 by 8 foot room with a small middle picnic table welded to the floor. George had expected to see the white-haired lawyer, but at the far end of the table sat a woman with the most beautiful, blonde streak hair in the entire known and unknown universe. Kim. George rarely showed his emotions, but now the tears flowed from his eyes unimpeded. Kim sat with a somber expression. The guard connected George's cuffed hands to a lock on the table, then left, closing and locking the door behind him. Kim and George sat in silence. George sniffled his nose, but was unable to reach his face to wipe off the tears. George broke the silence. I'm sorry. A single tear fell from Kim's left eye that she immediately caught with the palm of her hand. She was trying hard not to cry. I told you to be careful. Now you've gotten yourself wrapped up in this horrible mess. George didn't know what was real anymore. You're right. I was just... Kim shook her head no. It's okay. You don't have to tell me. Kim caught another tear. It was hard for George to see Kim this way. He just wanted to hug her. His voice was shaky, and he said, Fate caught up with me again. George, I'm going to help you out of this. So you're not mad at me anymore? George asked. I wouldn't be here if I was. I'm sad and I'm frightened, but I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at myself. I could have done more. Don't blame yourself, George said, starting to choke up. 
You still think my conspiracy theories are so crazy? Kim said, raising her eyebrows. What does she think happened? Kim didn't know the full story, and George didn't want to involve her any more than she already was. What have you heard? George asked, knowing that Kim would have been following the news closely. Your name and pictures from your MMA fights are all over the social networks now. How exactly did they get my information? George asked. I'm not sure, but I told you, the DPRA isn't airtight. A lot of people were against it when it passed and still are. Many of those against it are in law enforcement. All it takes is one bad apple to anonymously leak your information to the boards. And ironically, they can hide behind the DPRA all day long freely leaking your private information without repercussions. George shook his head. Well, at least one good thing came from my information being leaked. A lawyer that works with People First was here earlier to help me out. People First? Kim asked. It's a place I do fitness training on Saturdays. The shelter on Imperial Street. The lawyer's name is Jesse. I think her last name starts with an R, but they didn't let me keep the card. Kim asked, Are you sure this Jesse woman actually works for People First and not You Know Who? George looked up towards the camera high up in the corner of the room. A red light was clearly visible to the right side of the camera lens. Jesse was right. Omni would have records of everything. Smart woman. She seemed convincing to me, but you never know, George told Kim. It seemed that Kim was being careful not to give away information. She was using a gender-neutral pronoun when talking about Square. I see. Well, maybe I'll bump into them, she said, raising her left eyebrow. All of George's instincts told him to yell, No, don't get involved. But he knew if there was something fishy going on, Kim would uncover it. I trust that if you do meet with them, you'll have a lot of questions, he said, nodding his approval. George had already considered that Square turned him in to protect his project. Two questions occupied George's mind. How far would Square go to protect his project, and was there really some conspiracy? Kim smiled slightly. I'm sure I can come up with a few. Is there anything you need me to take care of at your place? Uh, maybe you can water my plants, George said, trying to lighten the mood. Kim smiled for the first time. Plants? You mean the one poinsettia I got you for Christmas? I'm impressed it's still alive. Kim always made sure to stealthily put water in the pot when she visited. I'll make sure it doesn't die. There was an almost perfectly timed knock at the door. Time's up. I'll be back on Sunday to tell you what I find out. Kim stood up and blew a kiss to George, since no physical contact was allowed. Moments later, George was back in his cell, alone. Kim left the jail with a determined look on her face. Chapter 12. Kim. Kim had read everything she could find out about the taco stand murder and followed the Justice for Alexander hashtag, but most of the information she found was just inflammatory against George. Kim was certain that George hadn't murdered anyone unprovoked or even on purpose for that matter. The facts were simple. George was at the taco stand on Thursday, and while George was there, a man had died. Video had yet to surface of the incident, but it seemed clear to Kim that if George hadn't met Square, none of this would have happened. George rarely ate out alone, so it's reasonable to assume that Square was at the taco stand with George since the incident happened at a time close to when the training session with Square ended. She was also sure it wasn't a coincidence that George was arrested in front of the letter building after meeting with Square. Either Square was involved, or he had information that Kim wanted to know. At a minimum, she wanted to hear what happened from Square's mouth. And more importantly, if Square was with George during the incident like she assumed, why hadn't he come forward to tell the police what happened? George hadn't given Kim any information at the police station, and Kim knew better than to ask him for it. If she wanted information, she would have to get it herself. Kim had learned during her years of doing PR work that when getting information, sometimes you put on sheep clothes, and other times you show your full lion. She suspected it was time to be a lion. Immediately after leaving the jail, she headed straight to the letter building. Once she passed through the air curtain, she spoke loudly as an angry mother being stern with her child. Letter? Yes. Welcome back to the letter building, OmniGuide answered. Welcome back? Kim's face had a curious expression. How do you know it's my second time? I have opium disabled, Kim said. I had yet to inform you of my Omni ID, yet you already knew to call me letter. From that, I deducted that you had been here before. It's possible I was mistaken. If so, I apologize, Omni said, sounding sincere. Smart. I see. So you don't have any records of my prior visit? She asked. I do not. 
It's prohibited in my programming to track anyone opted out of omnipresence mode. Well, I was here a few days ago, and I met with Square Puppenmacher, and I would like another meeting with him immediately. Can I tell him the purpose of your meeting? Just tell him it's about a mutual trainer friend. Understood. Please wait while I contact him, Omni replied. The first floor of the letter building, called simply The Park, was one of the most ambitious man-made parks in the world. Calling it a park was a disservice to the scale of the entire project. The ten-story atrium housed seven waterfalls, countless ponds, five-story cliffs, and hundreds of fully matured redwood trees purchased from multiple private redwood groves. This was only Kim's second time visiting the letter building. She was genuinely amazed at how closely the park resembled the actual redwood forest she visited as a child. With a directed sound wave, Omni spoke in Kim's ear. Mr. Puppenmacher has agreed to see you. Shall I guide you to his office? Is his office still on the hundredth floor? Kim asked. Yes. Then I do not need any guidance. Understood. The elevator will open when you arrive. If you require further assistance, do not hesitate to call out my ID, Omni responded. Kim walked from the entrance towards the large elevator enclosed inside of what looked like a redwood tree. The dirt path to the elevator made her feel as if she were hiking in Sequoia National Park. The air was crisp, and several times she had to swap away a bee or other flying insect near her head. As she arrived at the elevator, Omni spoke. The elevator will arrive momentarily. Almost immediately, the bark of the redwoods sunk into the tree, revealing brushed metallic doors with the words East 2 and a detailed picture of a forest etched on them. The doors opened and Kim stepped in. The panel on the elevator automatically listed Kim's destination, floor 100. The first time Kim had been in Square's office, it was under the guise she was a tourist looking for an observation deck. She correctly gambled that Square would feel sorry for her and let her into his office. This time, Kim would be more adversarial. The seals on the doors popped and opened up to an empty hundredth floor except for Square's desk, three guest chairs, two extremely realistic-looking mannequins, and a squared-off area with gym equipment. Square was sitting in one of the guest chairs. He stood up as Kim exited the elevator. We meet again, but this time I assume you're not a tourist looking for a view of the city. You would be correct, Kim said. Omni tells me we have a mutual trainer acquaintance. Maybe you can tell me which one it is, as I have a few, Square said. He knows I mean George. What's he hiding? I'm sure you know exactly who I'm talking about. I'm here to talk about George. All you have to do is tell me what happened, and I'll keep your secret safe. Square tilted his head, as if he were sizing up Kim. Ah, George, yes. I'm certainly inclined to help George as much as I can. But what's this secret you think you are keeping safe? Kim only had suspicions. She didn't actually know of any secret, but knew that when you want information from an adversary, it's best to make them think you already have it. Let's discuss your secret after we help George. There isn't much I can do that isn't already being done. George has great representation with Jessica Rutherford, Square said. Kim was surprised Square knew George's lawyer's name. May I ask just how exactly you know of Miss Rutherford's involvement before the information's been released to the public? It's not even on the private boards yet. Let's just say I have my ways, Square said. I would love to hear about your ways, Kim said, folding her arms. Square smiled. Kim, you seem to be under the impression that I have ill intentions in my dealings with George, but I assure you nothing I have done deserves your scorn. Kim found it unnerving that Square knew her name, despite her never telling Square or Omni. And what was more unnerving was that he knew to call her Kim and not her first name or middle name, Xing He. With George's privacy fetish, she was certain George hadn't told him. Kim squinted her eyes and held her index finger to her mouth. Let me see if I understand your dealings with George. You stop me if anything I say is wrong. Her tone was that of a prosecutor. Square had a look of intrigue on his face. Sure, you've got the floor. First, you hire George for three times his rate. I know George is a great trainer, since I was once his client, but we both know he isn't worth $750 an hour. A man with your resources could have paid 10 times that amount and had five of the best trainers on the planet. Yet you chose a failed MMA fighter? Kim felt a twinge of regret pointing out George's failed MMA career, but it was the truth. Square kept listening patiently as Kim paced back and forth while maintaining eye contact. Second, George tells me you're delusional. 
I'm curious as to what he meant by this. For some reason, George doesn't seem to want to talk about you. This in itself isn't a red flag, because George has always had strong beliefs on privacy. But I can't help seeing parallels between George and a once vocal theater owner that is now nowhere to be heard. And third, today George is sitting in a cell charged with murder. He was arrested right in front of this very building. And to me, it seems possible, if not certain, that the murder happened during lunch with you, yet you haven't made any statements to the police. Do you care to fill in some of the gaps? Square spoke. Kim, even you yourself said it in your blog. Allow me to quote, I would rather work with a damaged client than a pristine one that can't imagine ever being knocked off their pedestal. Kim shuddered. He knows my name, he knows my job, and he's directly quoting my blog from four years ago. Did he know who I was when he first showed me his office? Square continued, As to my delusions, indulge me for a moment. Was it delusional when the inventor of radio, Marconi, announced that he could send messages through the air? Was Henry Ford delusional to build an auto company after having failed three times prior? And was Walt Disney delusional when he flew over crocodile-infested swampland in Florida and decided to build Disney World on it? Kim interrupted. Perhaps you're trying to say, first they say you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world? Exactly. That's it. Square lit up. Maybe he thought Kim understood him. Kim shook her head. You know that quote was by Elizabeth Holmes who cheated investors out of billions of dollars. Certainly you've heard of one of the largest cases of investor fraud in the last 50 years. Being considered delusional doesn't mean that you're going to change the world. History is littered with delusional people who conspired with others to destroy millions of lives. Kim, I assure you George working with me isn't part of some elaborate conspiracy. George and I had come to a mutually beneficial agreement for him to help me with an important project. As my fortune would have it, if George hadn't been there, I might have been killed. But I assure you, Kim interrupted. Stop, did you say he saved your life? Yes, he saved my life. I thought you already knew this. Or else why would you be here? Kim locked her gaze on Square. So you were there with George at the taco stand, and George saved your life. Can I also infer that the man he saved you from is the one that is now dead? I didn't think these facts were in debate. It was a simple accident, Kim. And you should know that George himself convinced me not to talk about it. His arrest was quite unexpected. Kim barely heard what Square had said. She was angrier with Square than she had ever been with George. If George saved your life... Why are you sitting here in your office and not at the police station right now giving a statement? Square spoke towards the ceiling. No, everything's fine, Omni. Disable for an hour and ignore any elevated emotion alerts. Kim, ask yourself this question. If you knew that only you possessed the skills to complete a project that would save mankind, would you let the fate of one person prevent the saving of billions? Kim shook her head in disbelief. This isn't Star Trek where Spock says the needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many just before he ejects the warp course, sacrificing himself to save the crew. This is real life, so the answer is no. I would save the one. Square seemed to not have expected this answer. Based on the eloquent TV show scenario you quoted, I assume that you understood my words. But let me clarify that you would let billions die to save one? Kim couldn't believe Square's logic. Nobody wants billions of people to die, including me. I don't know what it is you do here. Nobody really does. Maybe you have discovered the cure to cancer. For my entire life, three or four times a year, I would see would-be cancer cures with promises of ending cancer for millions come up in the news. And you know what happens? Nothing. Nothing except a new round of funding for the biomedical research companies. Let me flip the question back to you, Square. If you were walking down the street towards a book that contained a magic cure for all disease, would you ignore a runaway bulldozer seconds away from running over a new baby? Square looked as if he was going to answer, but Kim stopped him by putting her hand up. The answer isn't black and white, Square. This isn't a debate competition at college where the winner is chosen at the end. You save the baby because its death is imminent. Then you keep walking to the next block for the magic cure. Help me save George. You have my word that I will do everything I can to minimize your involvement. It's my specialty. 
Kim, I have no doubt you're a skilled public relations agent, but surely your years of work has taught you that once the public latches onto a piece of gossip, whether it's true or not, it's nearly impossible to change the narrative. The moment my involvement in a murder is made public, everything I've worked for would be in jeopardy. I will be too scrutinized to help. I assure you, I'm more valuable behind the scenes than a single witness statement. Even if I agreed to everything you've said, I have no guarantee that anything you do behind the scenes will get George out of his predicament, Kim said. Square smiled, which to Kim didn't feel like the right response. Kim, I believe I have a way out of this dilemma. And what is that? The way I see it, your goal is to help George get out of jail. And my goal is to not have my involvement made public. It's easy for us to pinky swear that we would keep our word, but there's a way to guarantee it. I'm listening. What's your solution? It's simple. I will hire you as my personal public relations agent. Kim laughed. You are delusional. I have no desire to work for you or for letter. You haven't even heard what would be in the agreement. Allow me to explain. Fine, but every minute we're here, George spends another minute rotting in jail, Kim said. In the agreement, I will write a statement spelling out every detail I witnessed at the taco stand. I will leave nothing out, including my own involvement. Okay, so far it sounds like a great contract. Square continued. If 90 days from now, George is still under custody or still charged with any crime related to the incident at the taco stand, you will have my full permission to release my statement to the police. And I also agree to testify as needed. And furthermore, I will provide a million dollars towards George's defense. Kim held her hand to her forehead and put the other hand on her hip. This sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? The catch is, if my statement or this agreement is leaked prior to the end of the 90 days, you agree to pay me a million dollars, and you agree to never work in public relations or related fields for the rest of your life. Why on earth would I agree to that? Square turned away from Kim towards the west windows. This contract ensures that both of us get what we want. My project is uninterrupted, and George is out of jail. It puts both of our lifetime of work on the line. Now he turned back to Kim. All I'm asking is for 90 days to work behind the scenes to get George out of jail. 90 days is a long time for George to be in jail or have this cloud over his head, Kim said. I don't think it will take that long, but I'm sure you understand our legal system moves slow. Kim took a deep breath. Write it up and I'll sign. Chapter 13 George. At 5.55 p.m., the Omni Prison Service chimed and then spoke directly into George's ear. Dinner block commences in five minutes. Stand with your back towards the cell door and put your hands through the opening. An officer will arrive momentarily. George did as he was told, and a guard came and cuffed him. He was brought to a large room with several rows of metal picnic tables bolted to the floor. Once they were inside, the guard unlocked his cuffs and instructed him. You have 20 minutes to eat. If you finish early, let the guard know and we'll bring you back to your cell. You're not going to cuff me to the table? George asked. Not unless you cause problems. Keep on good behavior and you'll get more leniency. Cause problems and we'll have no choice but to cuff you, the guard said. Good to know. Is there a gym or yard I can work out in after dinner? George asked. You probably won't be here that long, as this is just a short-term facility. Once you're moved to a long-term detention center, you'll have more luxuries. Now go eat. George got in the food line. Remembering the advice from the intake guard, he carefully kept his distance from the other inmates. The food was some sort of goulash. It looked like beef and maybe corn. It was slopped on his plate along with a carton of 2% fat milk and a paper cup of water. There was an empty table close to the food line, but far from the door, and George took it. The goulash was bland. It felt like food that had already been chewed up once. George washed it down with the entire cup of water. Just after taking a second spoonful of the goulash, another inmate sat down directly in front of George. The large man's arms were covered in tattoos. Are you the one that killed Alexander? Trouble already. Look, I don't want any trouble. George kept his eyes down, but was on alert in case the guy tried to start anything. Who said I'm going to cause trouble? I just asked a question, the man said. 
Isn't it bad etiquette to ask what someone's in for? George asked. The inmate let out a huge laugh, spraying a bit of saliva on George's forehead. The only etiquette in prison is you watch your back. So why don't you do yourself a favor and tell me if you're the one that murdered Alexander? The inmate pushed his face closer to George's and stared him directly in the eye. George took a large scoop of goulash and brought it to his mouth, not saying a word. He then took a drink of water, but the cup was already empty. The entire time, the inmate maintained his close position. Looking at him dead in the eye, in a flat tone, George asked, Do you want me to move back, or do you want me to move you back? I want you to answer my fucking question, you piece of shit. This guy's giving me no choice. How about you back away and we both go back to ourselves in one piece? One piece? I don't like threats for piece of shit murderers. I won't be as easy to kill as Alexander was. The stench of the inmate's breath was overbearing. If George was going to prove self-defense in court, it wouldn't look good if he got into a fight during his first day in jail while awaiting a bail hearing. George stood up from the table slowly. Just then, two other inmates unexpectedly grabbed George from behind, each one locking onto an arm. The foul-breathed inmate leapt across the table, gripping a handcrafted shiv. He stabbed George over and over in his mid-region with downward thrust from the tabletop. George couldn't get free of the bear hug the other inmates had on his arms, and the table blocked any kicks by him to stop the shiv attack. He felt two cracks in his rib cage. The fist holding the shiv continually stabbed into George's gut. George found an opening to position his good leg on the metal table to get enough leverage to push back, but the inmates holding his arms overpowered his efforts. George's lung had punctured from the broken ribs, making it hard for George to breathe. The other inmates in the cafeteria now began fighting in a full-blown riot. Between the sound of his skin ripping and air whistling out of his lung, he saw the guards beating down inmates with their billy sticks, subduing them one by one. George's left lung had completely collapsed, and blood was leaking from his gut. The tattooed man switched his target and was now stabbing George repeatedly in his neck. The more he struggled, the stronger the inmate squeezed his arms. George felt the sharp pain of his left shoulder dislocating. The stabbing was rapid and unrelenting. As soon as it all started, it was over. The attacker and his goon helpers were pulled off of George and dragged from the cafeteria. George lay in a pool of blood, struggling to breathe with his remaining lung. The guards surrounding him were frantically calling in medics. George's thoughts drift as he continues to lose blood and his consciousness begins to fade. The roar of the crowd fills his ears as he enters the cage. The announcer screams into the mic, spraying spit on the mat. In the blood-soaked red jumpsuit hailing from the San Diego jail, we have Kim's boyfriend and personal trainer with $180,000 in debt. It's George Williams! Eardrums bursting from the echoing snaps of multiple bones fracturing in his knee. Blood trickles out of his ear as his face rushes to meet the mat, crashing into it as a distorted mess of blood and slashed flesh. His coach shrieks, Stay down! Stay down! You busted your knee! Kim's silky black, blonde-streaked hair slips over her shoulder, strand by strand, falling onto George's face. Sunbeams bounce off her milky white face, highlighting the delicate curve of her epicanthic folds. Uncontrollable laughter rings out from two lovers competing for dominance in a playful game of tickling. Kim straddles George's midsection, arching down, gently kissing the tip of his nose. The medics arrive as George's heart battles to continue beating. Unbeknownst to the heart, its every beat pushes the body it supports closer to cardiac arrest. Kim won't believe what happened.